My name is Samantha Bass. I'm owner of Samantha's Modeling. You are watching AccessTV.org. I'm Naisha McCauley and you're watching AccessTV.org. for <clears throat> visiting us this morning on Miss Cleo's Storytelling Corner. I have a wonderful surprise for you today. Uh, my guest today is Stephen Long and he's going to tell you a story. Um, I met him at a Hither and Yon That's right. uh, story um, organization, storytelling Circle, organization. Storytelling in, Circle in West Hartford. Yes. In, in West Hartford and uh, this was, oh, many years ago actually. And I was just fascinated about his his living in Japan, and he lived in Japan for 11 years, and he taught for two, and he was in children's theater when he started to perform. And this morning, he's going to perform for us. So I want to introduce him to you, um, and this is Steve Long. Good morning. Ohayo gozaimasu, as they say in Japanese. So. Haru ga kita, haru ga kita, doko ni kita. Yama ni kita, sato ni kita, no ni mo kita. That's a Japanese children's song. Haru ga kita, spring has come. Well, if we look outside, it hasn't quite come yet. But I know that the tree in front of my house has got little tsubomi, little uh, buds appearing. So, haru ga chikaku narimasu. Spring is getting close. If you think about stories, whether it's American stories or Japanese stories or stories from Africa, st the names of the characters are very important. If you think about Prince Bob, or Prince Robert, or Prince Valiant, and if you think about the stories Prince Bob or Prince Robert or Prince Valiant might appear in, these stories would be a little bit different. The characters would be different. The stories they would be told about them would be different. And the same thing happens in Japanese. They think about the names of the characters that go into their stories. Now, in English, when we write a character's name, we use the alphabet. But in Japanese, they use something called kanji. Kanji are where, where we take alphabet letters. Kanji uses shapes to create words. So, for example, this is a kanji. Okay? This shape here means ear. This shape here means mouth. And this shape here means to rule over. All together, this means wise. And it, in Japanese, this is pronounced sei. Now, when you name girls, either in real life or in stories, sometimes you use this kanji. This kanji is ko. It means child. So, in this case, sei ko, or I get that right? Sei ko, or <laughs> sei ko, means wise child. And I have a friend in Japan, lives in Nagoya, her name is Seiko. This character means flower, something we're very much wanting to see at this time of year. And when Shinichi Hoshi wanted to write a story about a girl who loved flowers, he decided that he would name his character Hana Ko, because Hana 
is the name of this character for flower, Hana Hana Ko. Hanako loved her namesake, the flowers. Nothing made her happier than to see a field of wildflowers all abloom. And nothing made her sadder than to see that same field wilt and die, or to see a place brown and barren with no flowers at all. One morning, Hanako was outside drawing what else but flowers when an idea came to her mind. Moles, she thought. Moles! Moles dig underground. You can train moles to go to places that have bad, good dirt and bring that good dirt to places that have bad dirt. And you can train them to go to places that have lots of seeds and to bring those seeds to places that have no seeds at all. And soon the whole world will be covered in flowers. Hanako was so excited by this idea that she drew it out from beginning to end. And no sooner had she finished that drawing when a strange wind came up, took it out of her hand and carried it away across the trees. That drawing continued its journey out over the trees and soon out over the ocean. And there it almost fell into the water, but a seagull flying high in the sky looked down and saw a flash of light. Yep, Sakamada! Swooped down, and by the time it realized it didn't have a fish in its mouth, that seagull had carried that picture to quite a safe height. The picture continued its journey out over the ocean out towards an island in that ocean, out towards some buildings on that island, through a window and onto the desk of the director of a secret military research institute. The director returned, looked down at his desk. <laughs> Quickly, he assembled all his department heads and presented to them what he believed to be the next command, no, the next impossible demand from their great leader. The scientist looked at the picture and realized that it would be too difficult to train real moles. But they had technology. They could create robot moles to accomplish these same tasks. They set about their work and quickly had a prototype ready. It looked like a real mole, had that long body shape, that long nose, those big clawed feet in front. But there the similarity ended. In place of fur there was a shiny metallic skin. That snout was fitted with the finest senses that they could devise. There was a cavity in the, the mole for which would hold soil or seeds, what was ever, whatever was necessary. And it ran on a tiny atomic motor so that it would go almost forever. The scientists were so pleased with their work that they decided to make many more of them in honor of the upcoming visit of their great leader. The day came. The great leader stood on the platform to his right, his scientists, to his left, hundreds of robot moles. He fired the lot of them, closed down the research institute, and abandoned the island. But the moles were left behind, and they were running. Soon all the buildings had disappeared under a carpet of fragrant flowers, and from there the moles spread out all over the world. They couldn't swim, but they could burrow underneath the seabed. One day, Hanako was walking to school. Every day going to and from school, Hanako passed by a place that always made her very sad. For as long as she could remember, this place had always been brown and barren, not even a touch of green. Today, Hanako looked and stopped. And though pleasantly surprised, was puzzled. Ara, ano hana wa toshite? For you see, in the middle of all that brown, a flower had just bloomed. Hana wa kirei na. The story of Hanako. Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you very, You're very welcome. much. It was a pleasure to have you on yeah. this morning and yeah. to tell us that wonderful story. Yes. Do you promise to come back sometime? Oh, if, if you want me to come back, we'd be oh, glad to come back and tell a little, sto a little longer story. <laughs> it looks like we've got a little bit of extra time yeah, here we, to cover. But well, that's, yes. what we did was excellent. It was good, very good, good for our first yes. time. And yes. I'm going to try, actually, to get more storytellers to come in. Yeah. Wonderful. And um, I've been stories, looking for stories. yes, looking for them. And, you know, I was not looking for a storyteller the other day. Um, it was last week when yeah. I... Um, ran into him and I I saw him yeah. sit down with a cup of coffee and I said, I yeah. know him. Yeah. Oh, he's a storyteller. Let me go over and ask him, could he yeah. come 
and tell you a story. And he was very delighted to tell you a story. Yeah, oh, yeah. So I am very delighted oh, well, that you came. Yeah, I, I love, because I lived in Japan, because I performed in Japan professionally in Japanese, side by side with Japanese, touring all over Japan, I have a command of the Japanese language. And when I came back to the United States, my feeling was that, well, I could translate these wonderful stories into English, but then the people would miss the flavor of the Japanese language. So that's why in a story like Hanako or, or in the other stories I tell, uh -huh. I mix the Japanese and the English together so that while you may not know exactly what the Japanese said, you will have a feel for what the Japanese language meant. So that, that is, perhaps a, that is a, a, perhaps a unique style to me, where some people telling stories from Japan or other Asians might tell them all in English. I take English and Japanese, mix them up in a, in a, a style that I call champon, which makes yes. Japanese laugh because that's a, actually a, a noodle dish. <laughs> but oh. it's a noodle dish with lots of different things mixed in. So that uh, I, I would, love yeah. uh, Japanese stories. Yeah. I tell Japanese yes. stories, but I try to tell them um, like, you know, you, di you just did the king, yes. you know, and then you did her, her voice. Yes. Well, I try to do it in that flavor in yeah. English, yeah. but you're absolutely right, because yeah. when I heard the king, I'm saying, yeah. wow, yeah. you know, and the, that's definitely a little girl in her amazement yeah. yes. of seeing the yeah. flowers. That was at really, yes. Yeah. And, and that's really what storytellers try to do. Yeah. Try to, if you're telling a story from a different country or a yeah. different culture, you try to capture yes. that culture and try. And because I remember going to a um, festival yeah. and they, how they said it was very important, and how one person um, yeah. got up and said she. They, sometimes people get very offended if you if you don't tell their stories in a proper way. They, yeah. At that time, I think they were talking about Native American. Okay. Yes. Yes. How sensitive they, they were about their stories yeah. and to tell them. So I always try to make sure yeah. that if I'm telling somebody's story that I kind of know something yeah. about them and I understand mm -hmm. something of the culture so I can yeah. tell it in the right vein. Well, and you were talking about, you know, when you had come up to me and asked me to do this, you were talking about internationalization and, you know, multiculturalism and things like that. And I think one of the things to realize is that there are many different ways to express things, and not just in the English language. Each language has its own view of the world. Each language has its own way of expressing the world. Yes. And it's important to understand that there are different ways of viewing the world. Yes. That, that's, that's, that's another reason why I try and do this in both Japanese and English. So people know there is more than just English to describe their world. Yes, and, and, and that's, a wonderful, that's a wonderful way to do stories. And, um, we thank you very much for My coming pleasure. today. I'm, I'm glad you invited me, and I hope you can have, have me back very soon. Definitely. Right now, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. I'm very happy to be here tonight to congratulate and support AccessTV.org. AccessTV.org has reached hundreds and thousands of people. It's done a great job informing the community about important issues in our city, our state, and our nation. I congratulate Stan McCauley and Naisha for the job they've done. And now on, with their new format, which will reach many more people and which will be available through many more formats, the future is very bright for AccessTV.org. Congratulations and may you continue your mission of informing our community. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for coming back. And I have another story for you. And one of my favorite storybooks is the Bible. We have such great stories in the Bible. And the story I, I, I really love is a story, the story about Ruth, Naomi, Naomi and Ruth, because Naomi has a special kind of woman. And I know that that woman's in a lot of families, that woman who directs you in a certain kind of way. And that stubborn child who follows her all around, just listening and learning 
from her, every word she says, and she directs the child to her destiny. And, and that's what um, the book of Ruth is about. Sometimes people say, what is that book after Judges? What does Ruth mean? What's it there for? Well, when the first time I read Ruth and I said, my goodness, this is my Aunt Bert. Yes, this is my Aunt Bert. She's just like this, directing, always directing to the greater good. When there's nowhere you could go, when there's nothing you could do, when you're stuck, Aunt Bert always has a way. She can always show you the way. So I'm going to tell you uh, the story of Ruth in, in um, my own words, not biblically, but um, there was a family and they lived in Bethlehem in Judea. And there was a famine in the land, no food. So they decided to go to Moab. And this was a family. The father's name was Lamelech, and then the mother's name was Naomi. And they had two sons, Milan and Kilion. Well, on their travels and they, they get to Moab, Elan dies. And so it left Naomi with her and her two sons who married Moab, Moab women. Well, you know, she was kind of discouraged. And maybe she was a little disappointed in the Lord, mommy. Here they are, they left their land, they lost her husbands. And they lived there, her two sons and her daughter-in-laws, for about 10 years. Then her two sons died. Oh, my goodness. Naomi had no husband. She had no sons. And there were her daughter-in-laws who loved her dearly. So one day she heard that in her land, in Bethlehem, the Lord was kind and it was food. And things were getting better, so she decided she was going home. So she packed up her things, and she brought her, she, and her daughter-in-laws, they packed up their things. And they started to go on their way. But hey, Naomi thought, oh my goodness, I have no sons for these women to marry. And even if I could have another child, they'd have to wait till they grew up. They cannot go with me. They must go back home. So she told her daughter-in-laws, you must go back to your home and marry and go back to your God because I have nothing for you. In those days, it was very hard for a woman without a husband to make a living. I mean, what could she do? There was nothing to do. You had to live with your wit. What was there to do? So the women cried desperately and she insisted go back to your home and marry and God bless you with good lives. So Orpha, which was one daughter-in-law, she went back to her people. But Ruth, who said, uh-uh, I'm not going anywhere. Where you go, I'm going. Where you stay, I'm staying. Where you die, I'll die there too. And if I don't, let the Lord be harsh with me. If I don't stay with you until death. Well, Naomi looked at Ruth and she said, oh my goodness. Then come. So they went back. And when they got back home and everybody saw Naomi, they got so happy. They said, oh, Naomi is back. Naomi is back. And Naomi her heart was still broken and she said don't call me don't call me Naomi call me Mara for the Lord has dealt with me so harshly and her and Ruth they found a place and they they stayed together but how are they gonna eat so one day Ruth went out to the field 
and she was gleaning. You know what gleaning is? Gleaning is, is when the harvest comes, what drops to the ground you leave for the poor. And so Naomi had her to go out and glean. And as she was gleaning in the fields, there was a man watching her. And it was very dangerous to glean in the fields. Anything could have happened to her, a young girl all by herself. And there was a man and said, is that Ni Naomi's daughter-in-law, the one that came from Mo Moab back here with her mother-in-law? to be with her mother-in-law and he called for her and they brought her to him for he was a very rich man and he says to her you only glean in this field because this is a safe field and I'll make sure you're all right so when Ruth got home she told Naomi all about this and Naomi's mind started to work how were they going to survive so every day Ruth went out and she gleaned in that field and brought food home and Boab gave her many things to be kind for he was an older man. So one day Naomi says, mm-hmm, you must go to the threshing, to the threshing floor. You know what the threshing floor is? That's, you know, where they're getting all the grain together and they're, they're making grain out of the wheat and, and they're thrashing it. And when he has, when he has drank, when he drinks his wine and lays down, you go lay beside him. And sure enough, and put on your prettiest dress and you go lay beside him. And that's what she did. And when this older man wakes up, he says, oh my goodness, this younger woman and Ruth said, you know, you must marry me. Boab says, oh my goodness, I, yes, I guess so. I must marry her. So he goes to the gate, to the great gate where they do all of their business. And there was one man that had a right to Ruth before him, a relative. And he went to him and the man gave up his right. And Boab married Ruth. And Naomi and Ruth were very well off now. And soon Ruth had a child. Oh, what a beautiful child she had. And the people did not say, Oh, Ruth and Boaz has a child. No. They lifted their, the baby up and they said, Naomi, Naomi has a child. She is no longer alone. She has a son. And the son's name was Obed. That was a beautiful day. And they talk about the generations and the generations go down and down and down until it comes to Joseph. And who was Joseph? And Joseph was the father of Jesus. I wonder why they told that story of a woman surviving, of a mixed marriage. Why did they tell of the generations coming down? There's a reason for that. And who started all of that? Who figured all of that out? A woman who had to survive and teach the young woman how to survive. Just as they're doing today, just as my Aunt Bird did for me and my sister. And there's so many women like that. And if you don't have one in your family, you just look around. They're there to direct us. Thank you for coming to Miss Cleo Storytelling Corner. And don't forget, you know, I have a bookstore on 677 Blue Hills Avenue called Books with all kinds of books for you to enjoy and all kinds of stories. And next week, um, we'll have another storyteller here for you. 
somebody else from a different culture. So you read a little, write a little. And remember, take care of yourself. See you next week. I'm very happy to be here tonight to congratulate and support AccessTV.org. AccessTV.org has reached hundreds and thousands of people. It's done a great job informing the community about important issues in our city, our state, and our nation. I congratulate Stan McCauley and Naisha for the job they've done. And now on, with their new format, which will reach many more people, and which will be available through many more formats. The future is very bright for accesstv.org. Congratulations, and may you continue your mission of informing our community. Thank you very much.